I'm Edie Lash, and I'm here inside the Hub Culture Studio in Davos. And I'm really pleased now to be joined by Dr. Philip Atiba Goff. He is a professor at Yale, and he's also the co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity. Now, we're doing this on quite a momentous day, and I just want to mark what that is. So it's the two-year anniversary of... Of George Floyd's public lynching. And it's coming in at an incredible moment in time. We're here in Davos, but something's happening in the U.S. as well. Tell us about that. That's right. The White House has announced an executive order on policing long overdue in the aftermath of the Justice and Policing Act, the George Floyd Act, mm -hmm. dying in Congress. This was the executive action that the White House felt like they could take. Okay. What's the significance of it? So it'll remain to be seen. Okay. Um, they've announced um, a bunch of things that you know, advocates have been asking for a long time, a, a database of officer misconduct that's national, so that for the first time we can say, hey, if you do something wrong in Cleveland, you can't then go be an officer in Cincinnati, because we know what, what, what it was that you did wrong. But it's so much less than what communities have been asking for for the past two years. There's one school of thought that the best way to honor George Floyd's legacy is to make policing better, make mm -hmm. it less racist, make it less deadly. That's stuff that I fought for for a long time. Mm -hmm. There's another school of thought that says the best way to honor George Floyd is to remove policing from the places where it can't do any good, yeah. make it less omnipresent. Mm -hmm. I believe that you got to do both and, but there's been much more of trying to fix and tinker with policing and much less of trying to create the systems of care that prevent the need or reliance on systems of punishment. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of disappointment as a response to that. There's a lot in there. Let's unpick some of what you're talking about. Uh, one thing I do know from, from the work uh, or the, the people I've interviewed around the subject is that there are places that are trying out some different methods of keeping people safe and well. Um, just talk us through some of those. I know that, they're not, or that we're not scaling them up enough yet, but talk us through some of the things that are working yeah, and, and the things that are working are often doing both and. They're making the mm -hmm. systems we've got better and then creating new systems. So in Denver, for instance, they created the STAR program. And what happens is you can call in, same number, 911. If you've got a mental health crisis and there's no threat of violence, they don't send a badge and a gun. Mm -hmm. They send community social workers or mental health specialists. And in Denver, the calls to 911 skyrocketed afterwards. What that means is there were a lot of people who needed help mm -hmm. on mental health, but were scared to call for fear of the police showing up. Wow. Right? In Berkeley, California, they after, I say, after they did a bunch of research there, mm -hmm. I'm sure inspired in part by your existence, <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> did a bunch of research to say, where are the problems? They asked a bunch of people to come in. And over and over again, we saw low-level traffic enforcement is uselessly dangerous, mm -hmm. right? They're just gonna give you a ticket if it goes right, and if it goes wrong, you could die. So they said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to send home the ticket and we're going to not have armed response. Mm. It worked well enough. Traffic incidents didn't go up. Um, crime didn't go up. Mm. And there were no dangerous incidents. Philadelphia then picked that up. Pittsburgh picked that up. Seattle tried a version of it. LA is going to do a pilot version mm. of it. So you can scale those sorts of things. And then last but for sure not least, in Ithaca and Tompkins County, New York, they all got together as a community and said, we don't need police so much as we need public safety. Mm -hmm. And the difference is we don't want to send armed responders to nonviolent crises, right? And we want there to be more accountability for where we are sending armed responders. So they're going to create a department of public safety hmm. as opposed to a police department, civilian-led, majority unarmed, and they're going to change the way that they manage the systems of punishment so they can divert resources to systems of care. Right? We learned early on in childhood that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right. We don't have public policy that mirrors that basic common sense. So we are seeing some changes. We're also not seeing an enormous change in how people who are not white are being treated by folks in authority with badges and guns. Uh, and I wonder what else we need to do. You've mentioned changing the systems. You've mentioned, um, you've mentioned changing the way that we keep people safe. But there has to be something around a mindset change, right? We have to look at how, why people 
think in racist terms, right? Like it, it's just a bigger problem than just in the police, right? It's a thousand percent bigger than just the police. And during the summer of 2020, what I kept saying is this, which at the time became the largest protest movement that the world had ever seen. It was an yeah. international issue. And yeah. to all metrics, the largest public protest in world human history. That wasn't just about policing. It wasn't just about race. It was about the ways in which we created systems that punish people for the decisions they make when all they had were terrible options. Mm. And it seems like the thing we want to do, the, the global issue, must be prejudice. As a psychologist of prejudice, mm -hmm. I cannot overstate how wrong that is. Okay, tell us about that. Prejudice flows from behavior, not the other way around. And prejudice is a weak predictor of behavior. It predicts mm. about 10% of behavior on average. Right? That's, that's not just prejudice, it's any generalized attitude. Instead, we change the systems and the mindsets will follow. Hmm. So the broader thing that we can do is say, all right, I see that there are people in my neighborhood, they make me uncomfortable. They live out on the streets, on park benches. They don't smell so good. They always ask me for change. Mm -hmm. I worry that they're not stable, so they might do violence to me or my children. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem of their choices or what resources we have for them? Because mm -hmm. I guarantee you, if we had training, if we had mental health resources, substance abuse resources, and a roof with four walls, they wouldn't be in your neighborhood making you scared. I agree with that. Is there anywhere that you, in the world, that you admire that you can say that's what good looks like? There are lots of places that have practiced what good looks like. Mm -hmm. They're frequently small places where it's easier for democracy to function. And unfortunately, they, are, they tend to be homogenous places right. where everybody looks kind of the same. Yeah. So people have looked to Northern Europe as a place that does criminal legal systems much, much better mm -hmm. until recently where we've seen visible non-white folks moving in as immigrants. Um, in, in larger numbers, and what's happened is they've started to literally look to the United States to see how to deal with dark people, right? So um, I'd say that there are places doing it well for their local communities. Mm -hmm. We've not really addressed the issue of racism and state violence in a comprehensive way. I'm glad the UN has just commissioned a new committee to look at mm -hmm. anti-black violence in policing globally, mm -hmm. but we're just at the beginning part of the journey of understanding this. People watching this, if you could give them one thing to go and do if they care about that, this issue, what would it be? Number one thing that anybody can do is strap in. <laughs> this is not going to be a short-term thing. I wish that George Floyd was the last public lynching I was gonna see in my lifetime. I am a thousand percent confident it is not. And so do anything but do it with the idea that you'll be doing it for the rest of your life. Because for sure, the people who are most likely to be targeted for state violence will live with the fear of it for the rest of theirs. Phil, thank you very much for stopping by the Hub Culture studio on this incredibly momentous day. We look forward to staying in touch and seeing how your work on this issue continues. I'm Edie Lush.